So let me start with my system. So I'm going to keep my notes so I don't don't stray. So. <coughs> So, what is a modular set? Well, so you start with a subgroup of GL2Q. Sometimes it will be GL2Q, uh, but usually it will be a, a, a congruent subgroup of SL2Z. Uh, M is a gamma module. Uh, let's say, and there will usually be a ring sitting around, and so R will be some ring. Um, and then delta zero, um, that's my notation for the set of divisors of degree zero on P1 of Q. So P1 of Q, I imagine as being, you start with the upper half playing, and P1 and Q is uh, the set of rational numbers on the real line together with the point at high infinity. Uh, and, um, okay. and so then, let me just tell you now, so that's how I'm thinking about P1 and Q. And then, I don't know if people can see that board so well. I'll move over here. Um, and then, uh, so what are the modular symbols? So the modular symbols over gamma with values in M, sometimes I'll write it that way, uh, that is the set of homomorphisms equivalent over gamma from delta zero <coughs> to M. Okay, and so if I have a modular sample, uh, I'll be thinking about things like this. So I'll, I'll tend to write things like this. Phi of R to X. And when I write that, what I'm, you might, in this interpretation, that would be phi of the divisor of degree zero, S minus R. So I'm thinking about uh, R and S, and a path in the upper half plane that goes like that. Uh, and so when I write, by R to S, I'm imagining it as an integral from R to S. Um, and so that's the reason for this notation. And of course, there's a, a remark that in fact, this captures an important part. It's a remark from the honor and ask myself uh, a long time ago that there's a natural isomorphism from the compactly supporting cohomology of gamma with values in M uh, to the modular symbols with values in M, okay? And so that, that maybe is the justification for this picture. Now the way of Jekyll sort of visualizing these things, it's fun to visualize things, these things too. Um, and so let me try, I'll do it here. <clears throat> so what you might think about is here's zero, you have I infinity up there somewhere. I infinity. And you can think about the path down, you have one, two, minus one, minus two. Uh, you can draw these geodesics connecting those guys. Take a half, one and a half. You make what's called the ferry tessellation. My picture's not great. Uh, but you can think about the, what's called the ferry tessellation of the upper half plane. And the idea is you draw the ferry sequence down on the, on the real axis, uh, and then you connect up. So let me just say it very simply. If I take the, the path from infinity to zero, which is this path, and then sort of apply the elements of SL2Z to it, uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, by uh, PSL2Z, I should say. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of PSL2Z and the edges of this of this thing, where uh, if I have a matrix gamma, this is A over C, B over D, where gamma is the matrix, 
A, B, C, D, and so those are two adjacent terms in some value sequence, is the idea. Okay? So I'm going to leave this picture on the board. This, by the way, is something that I learned a long time ago when I was in high school about very tessellations and very sequences. It was one of the first things that I actually fell in love with was this idea of continued fractions. And I think that is the initial reason why I got so interested in this project. Gary showed me how to use continued fractions to compute uh, periods of modular forms, uh, compute modular symbols, and so of course that caught my eye. Uh, of course, now there's very little continued fractions in the theory anymore, but still, uh, I like drawing that picture. And so uh, that picture, I'm going to leave on the board so I can point to it now and then. Okay? All right. Okay. So the idea is that a, a modular symbol, if gamma is a congruent subgroup, a modular symbol with values in M is a way of labeling the ferry tessellation. Uh, where each edge of the ferry tessellation, when I say that, labeling it, I mean just labeling the, the edges. Labeling the edges, giving each edge associated with some element of the, of the, of the module M, but doing it in an equivariant way, gamma equivariant way. Okay, so that's a picture of a modular symbol. Uh, and you'll see that if you do that, there are certain relations because we, we need to have, when we go down and over and then back up again, we better get zero if this thing represents divisors of degree zero. And so in order to make such a, a labeling, such a modular symbol, like, there are certain relations that have to be satisfied. And they're the ones you see in the picture, and they're called the monody relations. Okay? And so uh, we will use them without a lot of say here, but they're important. Okay, so now one of the things that that Barry taught us, is that when we're studying uh, values of L functions, at least for modular forms, uh, really what we're studying in some sense are these, are these modular symbols, or if you like, the, the homology of the modular curve, uh, and you're making certain homology classes in the modular curve and evaluating modular symbols on them, and you get numbers, maybe your elements of a module that, um, that correspond to values of, of an L function. Okay, so um, in particular, there are things like there are the universal L values. So the universal L value is, is the path from infinity to zero. Okay, or if you like, it's the difference between zero and infinity and delta zero. But that's the path that you integrate a modular form over in order to get the Mellon transform of the modular form, and so that gives, that's how we compute L, L functions. Uh, or another thing that you might do if you have a, a character, uh, to R, to the units in R, character, say a Dirichlet like character, then you might write lambda of chi, this, you see, is an element of delta zero, or it's an element of the relative homology of the modular curve. Lambda of chi would be some sum, uh, a equals uh, zero to m minus one, or let's say a, in z mod m cross of chi bar of a uh, times a over m. Okay? Uh, and if you integrate a modular form over such a thing, you'll get an L value, you'll get the value of the L, you get the L function, actually, uh, for uh, twisted by the great plate vector chi. Okay. Um, and so we think of lambda of phi, that means phi of that thing. Lambda of phi chi is just a notation for phi of that thing, etc. Okay, um, and so uh, it somehow changes the context for thinking about values of L functions, thinking of them as homology classes, which is very natural. Okay, so um, let me just give some examples. So this is a basic example. Uh, basic example. 
If F is, say, a cusp form of weight K for some group gamma, uh, where here K is greater than or equal to 2 and even, uh, we let omega F be the different is equal uh, 2 pi i times uh, uh, tau x plus y to the k minus 2 f of tau d tau. That's a differential form on the upper half plane. <coughs> Taking values in some space that I will call w k minus 2, uh, where w k minus 2 of any ring is just R uh, x, y homogeneous polynomial in two variables, x and y, of degree k minus 2. Okay? Um, and so, um, so this, this is the, the, the key thing is that if f is a cut form, this defines a gamma in, invariant uh, differential form. This is something that's invariant under the action of the group gamma. And so I can integrate it over paths and make a modular sample this way. And I want to do that. <coughs> then we define phi sub f uh, of any path from R to S to be the integral uh, from R to S of omega f. Okay, so that's the modular symbol, and notice that it takes values in the, the, the homogeneous polynomials with complex coefficients of degree k minus 2. Okay, now, uh, there's a theorem now of mine that I just want to mention, and then I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Okay, so, uh, Monin's theorem. So, um, for F and I get more. Um, and uh, then there exists a modulus and two modular symbols, actually, psi F plus or minus modular symbols for the group gamma. Uh, with values in W k minus two of the ring O of F, these are the, the this is the ring of Hecke eigenvalues of the form F, uh, such that and and compare it. Two periods, so I'll call omega F plus or minus, such that well let me call the lambda of phi F. So the universal, or the L value of phi sub f is equal to omega plus times uh, some, something I'll write i equals over i, i even uh, between 0 and k minus 2 uh, uh, some algebraic part of the cusp form with values in i plus 1 uh, times x to the i, y, to the k minus 2, i, minus i. Where these guys, the plus, sorry, plus also some minus part, uh, the point here is that phi sub f, the phi sub f can be written as, let me first say this, as omega f plus times phi sub f plus, plus omega f minus phi sub f Minus. So if we can sort of split the, the, the diff, this guy over here uh, into this plus part and its minus part, uh, such that uh, with the so these are like the algebraic parts, the omega or the psi f plus and psi f minus are the algebraic parts of the modular symbol associated to f. And when you take L values, you get something similar. You separated the L values of the cusp form into the even and odd parts multiplied by uh, the same. 
Okay, so these are the algebraic parts of the knowledge of the L function. Now, the, the message here, which is one that Barry taught us very well back in the old days, uh, is that is that my, you see, L functions are something that we all know uh, have something to do with arithmetic. So we think of we think of some arithmetic object like an elliptic curve or something like that. We make a, an L function, and that then is a way of encoding global information into some global analytic thing, and then we try to retrieve global analytic information out, or global, or global arithmetic information out. Um, but the message here when we do this, that not only are the values of the L function complex numbers that tell us something about arithmetic, but you can actually do arithmetic with the L values. And of course, by now, that's a thing that we know very, very well. Uh, but I just want to point it out, and that because it's, it's, the, it's what I'm uh, most interested in. Okay. So, um, okay. Now, so let me just... The next topic I want to talk about in this context is, is Eisenstein congruences, which is something that very uh, also... Uh, taught me a long time ago. Um, <coughs> let me go over here. All oh, my very tessellation to stay there for now. <coughs> okay, so a section two Eisenstein conference. And so the, the idea is to think about cases where cut forms are congruent modulo sum prime to Eisenstein series. And then can you say something about the associated L values? This is another very old story, and this typical example, standard example, or first example, is one that we've seen already in this conference, uh, is to start with uh, F, and S2 gamma 0 of 11, so F is Q times some product Oh, I've got that. Q oh, 1 minus Q to the, <laughs> the N uh, 1 minus Q to the 11 N Squared yeah, I'm going to square. Wait. Okay. Um, and so, an E, the Eisenstein series, this is modular for gamma 0 of 11, and there's an Eisenstein series, of, well, not, an Eisenstein series of weight 2, also for gamma 0 of 11. There's only one, the one form, the cut forms are one dimensional, and the Eisenstein series are also one dimensional, and this is this plus some sum, n equals 1 to infinity, some uh, modified version of the sigma function uh, times q to the n. And the thing that one notices here is that the f, it's not obvious, but it's true, that the f is congruent as a q expansion to the Eisenstein series modulo 5. And so in particular, you'll notice that the constant term of the Eisenstein series is divisible by 5. Okay? And so that's a congruence between two analytic objects, and the question is, does that tell us something about the, uh, the, these L values? Are they congruent? And the answer is, yes, they are. Um, and so, in fact, uh, and I'll write this down rather glibly, but I'll say more about it in a second. And so what one ends up with, there are I'll just state it in this case. Five sub, or chi sub f, I should say. Chi sub f minus is congruent to chi sub e minus mod five. The natural question would be to ask whether or not uh, there's a congruence between the modular symbols that res re respects or reflects the congruence between the cusp form and the Eisenstein series. And there are two periods. Plus period and the one theorem, which I've erased. Uh, there are two. But for Eisenstein's theories, there's only one, and it's this. Omega e minus is in fact two pi i. 
That's the theory. Uh, there's no even period. There's no, uh, no even part of the mind for symbol. And so we can't even, this doesn't quite make sense to frame this. Okay, now, um, so this, this is something that's interesting because, in fact, people like Rob Pollack and uh, Preston Wake have been thinking about uh, congruences even in the even case. Uh, and they do write down uh, congruences between micro symbols associated to F and micro symbols associated to E. But when they talk about the micro symbol associated to E, they're thinking about a boundary symbol. Boundary symbols are things that only depend, they're, not, they're actually extend to homomorphisms not just from delta zero to M, but also to gap from delta to M, where you don't take dividers of degree zero. That's much easier to make such things. Uh, and there, is, there are, in fact, elements of that thing that have the same eigenvalues as the Eisenstein series does. Uh, and so that's what people are, when they talk about those Eisenstein series, that's what they mean. But they're not talking about periods of Eisenstein series. Uh, and they're very simple things. Um, and so, so the question then is what happens, what, what do you do, what happens when you're working with an Eisenstein series and you have even, you're thinking about the even part of an Eisenstein series. Okay, um, and so, um, so that's the question. What does that mean? Um, and how do we make sense of that? Okay. So, um, well, let me just think about an example. I won't write down the actual example, but I'll describe it as best I can. I want to start with a, a cusp form. By the way, this, let me say right up front, that this is the, this is the question, the original question. I don't know what, where is Ron Yard Sharifi actually was starting with this whole stuff, but, but Ron Yard, certainly the simplest case of his theorem, or his conjecture, which is now theorem due to Foucault and Pato mostly, uh, the conjecture, he gave a conjectural formula for size of F plus mod P in the case where P is an Eisenstein prime, in the case where there's a congruence like this. Uh, and so that's really what I want to talk about. Okay, so, <clears throat> so Sharifi's conjecture, let me just state. And I'm going to start with a simple case. He says much more than what I'm going to say right now, but I'll try to say something that's his full conjecture in a moment. Um, so, start with a cusp form on SL2Z of weight K k greater than or equal to 2, and p, a prime, it will always be greater than 2 for me, a uh, prime, such that uh, the pair pk is an irregular pair. Now this condition that it should be an irregular pair basically says uh, uh, by the way, I want the p, p would be bigger, not just than 2, I might be at least, okay, I don't want to worry about small primes. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and so, um, and so this just means that there's a congruence between this I, this, this cusp form, uh, I, I, I want to say this an eigen form, the Hecke eigen form, and then I'll have an Eisenstein series, there's only one the one space of Eisenstein series of weight k on SL2z is one dimensional. Uh, and so I'll take a generator of that thing. Uh, and suppose, so e, e then, think of it as my, if minus bk over 2k plus, again, some sum, uh, n equals uh, 1 to infinity, some sigma k minus 1 star of n. To the end. There's its Q expansion. And I want the cusp form to be congruent to E 
modulo some prime p, where p is some prime, say, in the in the Heck algebra or in the in the ring generated by the Heck algebra by the Heck eigenvalues of f, uh, and I want f then to be congruent to e as a q expansion. If that's going to happen, then the only way that can happen to take it, it must be the case that the constant term is, is in p. So p then is some prime above p. That doesn't look like a p for terms. Okay. Um, and so the condition that pk is an irregular pair, and I'm thinking of it really as a state, what I really want is this congruence between the cusp form in an Eisenstein series and the Eisenstein series. So then, uh, I, okay, and so, so Rodnar gave a, a nice conjecture for what the value, what the algebraic parts of the L value should look like in this situation. So I want to just describe it quickly. So let R, let R be Z bracket at P root of unity and invert P. Okay? Uh, and U, maybe I'll write U, I don't know what I'm going to write, will be the, the units in R modulo P powers. Um, and so that's just some FP, finite dimensional FP vector space written uh, multiplicatively. There it is. <laughs> um, and so, um, okay, so now we take the U and we write it, we can decompose it. Uh, let me just use the same notation I used before. I equals zero to P minus two uh, U uh, one minus uh, Okay, sorry for the for the weird way of, of arranging this, but uh, and so this means by this I mean the, the, the part of you we can decompose you into eigenspaces for the action of the Galois group of Q zeta P over Q. Uh, so that's just some type character. Uh, and so we're taking this is decomposition into the components on which the, the Galois group acts by the one minus i power of the type character. Okay, um, and then we let eta i. be equal to the projection of 1 minus zeta p, this is an element of r cross, uh, to u1 minus i. Okay, so that's just some, some element in the, in, the, in the 1 minus i piece of that thing. Um, and Okay, and so the conjecture then is something like this. Let me get it exactly right. So, <clears throat> what we think about, we take u tensor u. Of course, this maps down to by uh, Coomer theory tensor h1 uh, f u p. Uh, and that then goes by cup product to H2 after UP tensor 2, which is K2 of F uh, mod P. Okay? And then the term of Tate says that there's an isomorphism from there to A, uh, A tensor UP. Uh, and so our A is the class group of the field F. F is the, the field the, the field of fractions of R, of course, uh, modulo P. Okay? Um, okay. Now our congruence says that PK is an irregular, PK is an irregular pair, and so PK irregular uh, implies uh, by Ebron Rivet that a 1 minus k is not 0. The 1 minus k component of this a, the action the same way, the same definitions, uh, is not 0. 
And so, um, what we do then is we let uh, lambda r for each r for each r <coughs> we let lambda r be uh, the I'm going to call it, I'm going to hit myself, uh, what did I call it, a to r, a to i, a to r, a to r, times for uh, a to uh, k minus, or what I want to say. And that's right, okay. Okay, uh, and so this, the, this then, uh, is an element of u tensor u. I'm thinking of it as an element of u tensor or u. And then I take, I call this, not this map, but this one up here, rho. And I take rho of lambda r. Uh, that lives in this, in this a uh, tensor mu p uh, 2 minus k. Okay, it lives in there. Now, under special conditions, and, and it, it, this this group might be this ring. This, this is a, a, an FP vector space, if you like. Um, it will be one-dimensional in examples. It's always been seen to be one-dimensional. It could be higher dimensional, in which case what I'm saying is is too weak. But the point is that that I can say take a linear functional of this thing and identify a piece of it as a as sort of a line. So I'm going to think of the row of lambda r as actually being an element of FP of the choice of the basis. Okay, a choice of some linear functional, if you like. And so Rondar's conjecture says that, let me make sure I get it exactly right, uh, Rondar's conjecture says that if you take size of f plus, appropriately normalized, and evaluate on the, on the universal special value, you will get modulo p, uh, the sum over even r's of k minus 2 choose r uh, lambda r x to the r uh, y to the k minus 2 minus r. Okay, so it's a bit of a strange statement. So I have to have this ability to think of elements of the class group as elements of that p. Okay, but other than that, uh, to normalize things. Uh, it, it, but the statement is that when I take that L value, that's what I'm going to get. So, um, it's kind of an interesting statement. Maybe it's just identifying uh, coefficients, uh, sort of the coefficients of this modular symbol with certain elements built out of K2. Okay? It's a nice statement. So, this was his conjecture. And I, to be honest, I don't know exactly what motivated it. I find it uh, an amazing statement, and so um, I, I had a student at that time, her name was Cecilia Busuyong, and I said, well, this is a fascinating conjecture, why don't you do some computations, I think we can see it. And so she did some, she did some calculations, she actually first had to figure out where it all meant, so she was, it took a couple of months, I didn't hear from her for a while, a few months later, uh, I got an email from her at about 9 o'clock one evening, and she said, I've done the calculations for these two examples, I don't remember which ones, and it's checked out. Okay, so that was great. And so I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and I had another email from her at 3 a.m. Uh, that said, and I can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, I was kind of surprised. Her, her statement of optimism might have been a little bit strong, uh, but the point was that she saw the idea of, of, of what had to be due to prove at least uh, something about this uh, that was interesting. And I should say up front that I communicated this with uh, Ron Yar Sharifi, uh, and, and he said that he had just discovered the same thing. So it seems like a, a simultaneous, close to simultaneous, I don't know exactly, uh, discovery. Uh, but the, the argument turns out to be fairly elementary. And so um, let me just write down the idea. <clears throat> okay, um, and so I've already got my fairy tessellation. There it is. 
Um, okay. And so what she does is she defines a modular sample. It's a modular sample. And I'll write it down in terms of the ferry tessellation instead of uh, this other way. And so here it is. Uh, so apply of, if I have a matrix gamma in SL2Z, then if I take gamma times, uh, I take the path from infinity to zero, and I apply gamma to it, that will give me some edge. Okay, every edge rises in that shape for exactly one gamma, if up to the sum. Uh, and so, uh, this is, well, if gamma looks like this, if it's something, something, x, y, and it's congruent to that mod p, then the body can read off what it is uh, from the bottom row. It's just, you take 1 minus zeta p x, 1 minus zeta p y, um, uh, and this is the Steinberg symbol happening in k2 of the ring r. Uh, and so this, what she said, is that if I put that, I label the, ver the edge of the very tessellation that way, then it's equivariant. That's actually what she proved. Uh, and it's not too hard to prove. And you end it, it's a modular sample that it satisfies the monument. The fact that it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's equivariant is not so hard. That part that's interesting is that it's a, it's a, it's a, it satisfies the monument relations, and that was just a matter of writing down some particular uh, relation in K2 of that ring, uh, which was not very hard to do. She just came in and showed it to me. It worked beautifully. It was amazing. Uh, and so, uh, and so, this is a minor step. Okay, so <coughs> satisfies the mon in relation, and I'll leave it like that for now. Okay, now Sharifi's conjecture, of course, much more than this. So let me try to state a little bit more about what he did, what, is, what he actually conjectured. Uh, oh, I should say something. Part of, part of Ron Yard's conjecture is that, is that this should reflect the, the Michael symbol that we're writing down should be corresponding to the Eisenstein series. So in particular, this modular symbol ought to be, the, this part of the statement is that it's a, it's a Hecke Eigen symbol. And that the eigenvalues are the eigenvalues of the Eisenstein series. Now that's the part that turned out to be really hard. Okay? Uh, the evidence was there. You can see that the congruence has worked. So it was right in the examples. Uh, but uh, so Celia sat down and she tried to prove it, wrote down what it meant for T2 to be have the right eigenvalue. And she found some relations, some uh, relations in the Steinberg, Steinberg samples that imply that. And so she proved that this is actually uh, an eigen symbol. For the anchor operators T2 and T3. And that's it. <laughs> and they were hard. They were pretty impressive. Ron Yard did the same. I don't, I, I'm not sure, but it seems to me I remember somebody saying they had a proof like this for T5, but I'm not remembering. But, okay, but the point is that proving that this worked in general, that it was a, an Eisenstein sample, uh, was really, really hard for some reason. Okay? Alright. But that doesn't stop us. Just can make more conjectures anyway. Um, and so, so let me just say then that similarly we can define. I should. Uh, uh, I haven't written it down even in the one case. Uh, sort of. The, or let me say. It. Let me just say it since I'm getting close. Um, so let H N plus be equal to the homology of the modular curve x1 of n p to the n with values in zp. And I'll take the plus part under the action of context conjugation, where here n is some level, tame level. And so these guys are relatively prime. Uh, and suppose, again, that we're in the case where you have this irregular uh, where pk is an irregular pair, and then uh, the idea then is to understand what happens as you go up the modular tower and as you go up the six atomic tower. And so the omega n is defined to be, uh, you can define some map 
A n plus two A n minus twenty one. So it's the same A n, but now it's the class group. It's the p power part of the class. Actually, it's the p to the is the class group on p to the n of the of the field f n as you go up the tower, the second tower. Yeah. Okay, this is a class group. Okay, and uh, and so it's a map that's defined not so differently from this, um, and um, so he calls this. But then he says this factors through the Eisenstein quotient. So H N plus modulo and Eisenstein ideal uh, I, where the I is what you think it is. Okay. It's a little complicated, but I'm going to write it down. I is an Eisenstein ideal. Um, okay. Uh, it calls this thing Pn. And then the omega n goes from, think of the omega n, and really is something from Pn to An minus. Uh, and, and that's the first part. The first statement is the factors for the Eisenstein thing. So I'm just making the remark that even in the simplest case, proving that back to the Eisenstein quotient was not obvious. Uh, and so, but the conjecture is that that always true happens. And moreover, moreover, on the omega n, or upon the omega n, I'm just telling anybody else we call it pi n, uh, to a n minus of 1 is an isomorphism. So that's the second part. And he, he then, I don't know, does he actually say that? Hold on a second. He doesn't, I don't actually have that statement written down here. I want to be careful. Uh, moreover, the right thing to say is that if I take a limit, uh, as n goes to infinity of the pn plus, that goes to some projective limit with respect to the norm mass of an minus of 1. And this is the map that he describes as, a, as, a, as an isomorphism. That's the conjecture. Okay, so, um, so I ended up, it's a little bit of a mess to read it all. This is part A and that's part B. Um, and so um, he, he said more. He built some sort of a piatic L function associated to all of this, uh, which is, I'm sure, important. But, uh, but I'm not, I don't want to talk about it now. And there's, there's part of this, what happened here is that Sharifi, I'm not Sharifi, but Fukaya and Kato, about this time, came up with a proof of, of this conjecture, pretty much as I've written it down, under the hypothesis that the uh, Kumoto Leopold piatic zeta function associated to the level n, so the tame level n, uh, has no multiple zeros. I think that's the only hypothesis uh, that they needed. They wrote down an inverse to this map omega. Uh, and, and then computed it both directions and, and said basically it's the, it's the identity of either direction. Okay. So, okay, now, uh, what happened here is that Celia and I were very interested in trying to prove the statement that this guy was an Eisenstein class even in the simplest case. And so we did actually do some stuff, and I think I might have enough time to jot some notes uh, about what we tried to do. I want to write down some modular symbols, and this is the first one. This is the first one. Uh, it's not so obvious, but it's not so hard either. And so, <clears throat> so what we did, uh, we were trying, we said, okay, what's a, how do we define heck operators? Well, we're used to thinking of them as, as double coset operators. And so we'll try to use some representation theory in this business. Uh, and so, what we did is we introduced some ring, I'll call it R1, some ring of, of trigonometric functions. So, e to the 2 pi i z is an example of one. Uh, the sine of z is an example of one. Really, those are pretty much the only ones that we use. Uh, but in the other ones that you know, they're there as well. Okay? The point is that these are our power series in Q, where Q is e to the 2 pi i z, and you can specialize Q1. And if you do that, you, will, you might get mixing in 
uh, roots of unity and things like that. And you, so we try to compute K2 of this ring in a way that we could remember, in a way that had an action of, of, of groups on it. And so the, the group uh, GL1 Q acts on that thing. There's an actual action. You can imagine what it is. And so, uh, so we first made a distribution on Q taking values in what I'll call K1 of R. K1 of R is just R1 cross. Okay, uh, and so I won't say what our distribution is, but it's, it's, it's kind of what you think it is. You, you make test functions on Q, and you make homomorphisms from the, from the group of test functions to this thing, and it's, that's a way of expressing certain distribution relations. And then we prove that there exists a unique modular sample. I'll call it five, from delta zero to distributions on Q2, taking values in K2 of some ring, which I also won't write down, some ring of, of trace vector functions in two variables. Okay? Uh, okay, now this is not exactly right. We had to divide by some ideal. I can tell you what it is, but for now let me just try to get something on the board. This is an ideal in the, it's, it's, the, it's actually the uh, part, you take K, K, the Milner's ring, K ring, the Milner's K, K ring of the ring R2. That's a graded ring of had lots of graded pieces. I'm just looking at the graded two part. And there's a part of it, it and I'm taking the ideal generated by what I call Q1 and Q2. I told you what Q is. So Q1 and Q2 are the two variables. Okay, that's a pretty trivial uh, submodule. But if you mod out by that, this thing becomes a modular sample where there exists a unique such thing where two things are true. One, phi is GL2Q of it, GL2Q invariant. And B, and I'll leave it to your imagination. The Q2 acts on this, and it also acts on the R2, and it's a mixing of that. Uh, okay. And the other thing is that the, uh, the phi, I just have to tell you what its L value is. And its L value is mu1 Uh, in other words, I should, to be very precise, I should be saying something like P pi 1, you pull back pi 1. I think of uh, Q2 has two projections to Q. And I'm taking the a modulus, I'm taking a distribution on this, pulling back by one of the projections, and then taking some convolution product of that with the pull back according to the other uh, projection. Okay. Um, okay. So there are, and, and now the idea was, and I, I should make what I say is there, whatever I've written down is true so far, but this isn't what we wanted to prove. We wanted to use this to prove that the things you've written down was an item symbol for Hecke. Uh, and we never got back to that. Uh, we wrote this down, we, so I'm not even able to tell you uh, how the idea was that we would be able to specialize this uh, at Q1 equal certain points and be able to say that they should sort of make a class out of this that's a head eigen sample, way upstairs, and then specialize it and say that it's an eigen sample downstairs. Uh, we had never completed this project because it was about this time that uh, Fukaya and Kato announced the general proof uh, and it, we were getting lost in details and stuff. So it seemed like a good place to study, try to figure out what Fukaya and Kato were doing. Okay, so um, the idea, let me just, since I'm out of time, let me just uh, say that what, what Fukaya and Kato, uh, what Fukaya and Kato did was they made a modular sample uh, out of valence and elements built out of, out of Ziegel units. And so, uh, so specifically, uh, this is actually, in my world, this is due to Goncharov. Uh, you take uh, the 
legal units, G zero U back with G zero V. And when I write this, let me be careful, it's U over N P to the N. And this is a V over N P to the N. You take the Steinberg symbol. Uh, so this is some element of K2. Uh, and I'm going to think of it not living at level n, so it's fine to think of it. Let me write it at level n. Gives an element of K2 of uh, that modular curve. And what they do uh, is they, they then make a, a modulus, they make a modulus symbol uh, from h1, x1, and p to the n to 2k2. Y1 n p to the n um, <coughs> that specialize and then they specialize at infinity. In other words, they make a map. You can specialize these guys to make elements of K2 of these of these rings. Let me just write it down. Uh, 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 I would call them the same type of argument. Let me just write down where it ends up. A n minus a one. It's a specialization. You take this guy, uh, and so it's an element of K two of this thing, but but you specialize it at the infinity cost. I'll write infinity here. Uh, you're specializing that element of, of K two, and when you do that, the idea is that specialization at a point like infinity sort of is an Eisenstein. So it respects uh, the Hecke operators, the eigenvalues are those of the Eisenstein series, and in fact of the of the boundary symbol, in fact. Uh, which is a thought that just occurred to me recently. But uh, because they're only using one cost, that's the thing that's interesting. Okay, so um, and the, but the modular symbol is, is made as follows. Uh, looking again at the variance tessellation. I take the U and the V is is given by I take the u and the v and I associate to the same thing. I take a, a gamma u v. This is an element of SL2, uh, this is actually yeah, an element of SL2z, um, where this thing is congruent modulo n t to the n to something like this. And you put that, so for that guy, you find this modular symbol to be at this, this path, this new modulus of path, you define it to be that. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop except that I want there's one more thing that I just want to at least say. Um, the thing that I'm that I personally am interested in right now, which I'm not able to it's hard to talk about, um, is a is a related modular sample. Uh, it's built in the same spirit. It's, it, it, many people have seen this thing that uh, Bruno uh, had a nice paper in which he wrote down a modulus symbol uh, taking values in, in uh, certain, well, he didn't describe it distribution theoretically. And so our formulation of this is to make a modulus symbol <coughs> of this type, it's a distribution, instead of Q2, use matrices of two by two matrices with rational entries. Uh, that's a four dimensional Q vector space. So you talk about distributions on that four dimensional Q vector space, taking values in K2 of the modular tower, all the way up the tower. Uh, and, and this is due to Bonjour, by the way. It didn't state it the way I'm stating it, but it's, it's equivalent uh, to, to this. And it's a, also, Bruno gave a different proof of Bonjour's theorem with some extra restrictions. Uh, but the, the, the statement is that there's some, in the, in the form that I like it, is that you're getting a distribution on M2 of Q taking the origin K2 of the modular tower. It's built not so differently from this, except that you don't require the zero for the first coordinate. This is just so that you can specialize at infinity. Uh, you use A and B. So the, the, the first column of the matrix over there is AB, and the second column of the matrix that I'm thinking about over there is, is CD. Uh, and um, you get some big modular symbol, and I believe that this modular symbol deserves, in some sense, to specialize to the modular symbol that Celia and I wrote down. 
uh, and, but more. I expect it to be a lot more than that. Uh, and let me just say a little bit more about it. When you specialize at the cusps, uh, one of these, uh, one of these bailiffs, for example, say, uh, you have got to worry about whether or not the the uh, the, the binder units are holomorphic or they're non-zero and, and holomorphic at the cusp that you're re re specializing at. And so when you take, even though this 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 thing I call it the Cockrell valence and binder sample, following Bruno's suggestion. Uh, but um, it doesn't give, give you a stable, it's honest. But when you try to specialize at the cusp to make something Eisenstein from the boundary, you have problems because uh, you don't know that you can specialize at all points. And so you only get something called a partial, what we might call a partial modular sample. And I'm, I'm sort of tending to call them pseudo modular samples uh, because there's something about them that feels like you should be able to smooth them in the same way that you smooth uh, chaotic measures to make them. Uh, bounded, things like that. Uh, and so, in any case, so I'm interested now in this relationship between these two things. Uh, and I should say up front that my, my main interest is uh, right now has been in this Darmoldas Gupta conjecture. Uh, and so, the Darmoldas Gupta conjecture, the Dar Darmoldas Gupta made a piatic measure uh, and they gave a formula for a conjectural unit in some, uh, above some, in some gray class field. Of a, of a real quadratic field. Uh, and that formula involved piatic integration with respect to that measure. Now that measure that they write down can be described in terms of this thing that Celia and I did. It, it's a, an easy description of it, um, but it's just another description of the, of the thing. And there doesn't seem to be that, that distribution somehow needs to be enriched. That's the feeling. But you've got to enrich it somehow in order to make these modular, in order to make a unit. Get, it, get some arithmetic out of it. And so that's basically my interest right now, is just to examine this cockle valence and binary symbol to see if it has enough information in it in order to recover uh, in some com a com concrete form uh, the conjectural unit. Okay, so I'll stop. I'm sorry.